Hello, everyone. Uh, okay. It is a great pleasure uh, to present my paper with Doshin uh, in this uh, seminar uh, series. So as the uh, title indicates uh, in this paper, so we aim to identify uh, potential biases in technology adoption in uh, platform markets. So to motivate our study, so one uh, challenge to competition policy uh, in the digital platform markets is the many services are provided free to consumers. So when the service is free, uh, the exercise of market power and the consumer harm uh, come in the form of a low quality of service, less innovations, or uh, less uh, privacy protection. And this concern is uh, particularly uh, important uh, because uh, this industry is uh, very uh, dynamic and the innovations play a major uh, role. So the same message has been uh, conveyed by many uh, recent uh, policy reports on platform markets. For instance, uh, CMA report and the Furman report in the UK and the Kramer report in the EU and also the Chicago School uh, Stigler report and the, actually more recently, uh, House Antitrust Report on uh, Big Tech in the US uh, make a similar uh, point. So to quote uh, some, uh, some of the reports, uh, for instance, the CME report says that first, uh, competition problems may inhibit innovation and the development of new valuable services for consumers. So this impact on innovation is likely to be the largest source of uh, consumer harm. And the same uh, sentiment is also echoed in the Steve uh, report. So in this paper, uh, we address uh, one particular uh, aspect of innovation, uh, which is uh, to identify uh, potential biases in technology adoption incentives in two-sided uh, markets. So as there are two uh, distinct uh, groups of uh, users in the market, one issue that can arise is how the platform will uh, allocate its limited resources between the two. In other words, whether uh, to favor the consumer side or the advertiser side, if there is some conflict between them. And whether this decision is uh, socially uh, optimal. So we analyze this issue uh, first in the context of a monopoly. Okay, so then we consider a duopoly situation to see uh, how uh, competition influences this trade-off between the consumer side and the advertiser side. So in this exercise, uh, we consider uh, two uh, cases. One is the case where the service is provided at a positive price and the demand can, can uh, respond to, to, to the price change. And the other is for the case where services are provided uh, free. And in the paper, uh, we endogenously derive the conditions under which a free service is optimal for the platform. And the one uh, main uh, result is that uh, the biases in technology adoption can be uh, very uh, different depending on whether the non-negative price constraint is binding or not. And our research also suggests that uh, the optimal regulatory policy, okay, response may also differ across the two cases, whether depending uh, services are provided at a positive price or uh, free. And even though uh, we couch our, our analysis in the context of a technology adoption, so our, our framework and the research can be applied to uh, other uh, contexts. So in particular, we can reinterpret uh, the results as a biases in a platform, the certain uh, business uh, policy choices. So we consider uh, two such examples. One is a privacy uh, policy, and the other one is ad load policy. So when we say ad load, this is uh, the decision of the platform, how much advertising to show and how to show it. And these policies uh, inherently involve trade-offs uh, between the consumer side and the advertiser side. Uh, in that more advertising can inflict a nuisance cost on consumers, uh, but may uh, generate a more advertising uh, revenue. And the same can be, can be said for uh, privacy policy.
Okay, so my, my screen is not moving. Okay, so. Okay, so for the interest of time, uh, I will not go over the literature review. So let me just mention that uh, many people in the audience have been uh, major contributors to the uh, related uh, literature. Okay, so the plan of the talk is the following. So I will spend the most time uh, to talk about the monopoly model. And in this case, we are going to consider two cases, whether the non-negative price constraint is a binding or not. In other words, whether services are provided at the positive price or for free. And then uh, in case I may uh, run, out of, run out of time, so I will discuss uh, some policy implications before uh, the duopoly model. Then I will present the duopoly model, and then uh, if we have some time remaining, then we, will, we can do some, some further discussion. Okay, so let me start with the monopoly uh, platform. So we consider a monopolistic, monopolistic platform with uh, consumers and uh, advertisers. So on the consumer side, uh, we uh, denote the gross uh, surplus per consumer by U. And the P is the price uh, paid by the consumers to the platform. And then the difference between U and P is a net surplus provided by the platform to consumers. And this is denoted by S. And then uh, demand will increase in the net surplus provided to uh, consumers. So in particular, so we are going to assume that uh, D prime S is positive. In other words, the more surplus is provided, there'll be a more uh, demand. And the more importantly, uh, we assume that when the platform attracts consumers, each additional consumer allows the platform to generate additional revenue from the advertiser side. So more specifically, uh, we assume that uh, the platform can, can generate a total surplus of beta from the advertiser side And the platform can extract a tau proportion of the surplus, where tau is uh, uh, any number uh, between uh, zero and one. So that means uh, each uh, additional consumer generating advertising revenue, okay, so this can be written as a tau multiplied by uh, beta. So beta is the total surplus, and out of a total surplus beta, tau proportion will be captured by the platform. And we provide uh, some micro foundation uh, of the model in the appendix. And admittedly, uh, we adopt a very uh, simple uh, reduced form uh, to describe the advertising side. So one main reason for our modeling strategy is that the boundary of the advertising market is uh, much broader uh, compared to the product market on the consumer side. And potentially many more players are, are involved. So for instance, if you consider the display advertising market, there is a variety of publishers and the content providers that compete along with social media on the supply side. And they rely on various advertising intermediaries uh, to sell their advertising inventories to a large number of advertisers. So hence, uh, if a publisher is a monopolist, even, even, even if a pub publisher is a monopolist in the product market, it may have a less market power on the advertising side. So in this regard, uh, one uh, important factor uh, determining tau is what is called the ad tech, uh, tax, uh, which represents the share taken by ad intermediaries. Uh, from the advertising expenditure paid by advertisers. So for instance, uh, small platforms uh, that rely on ad intermediaries will have a smaller tau, uh, while uh, big tech platforms that have built their own digital ecosystem, so they don't have to rely on ad intermediaries, then they will, uh, uh, they will not be subject to, to ad tax and they will have a larger uh, tau. So this is the way we, uh, model the advertising side. Now with uh, this uh, setup, the monopolist property can be written uh, 
in, in this way. So can you see my mouse moving? Yes. Okay, so there are uh, two uh, sources of revenue uh, for the firm. So one is from the consumer side. So that is uh, captured by P. And uh, there is another uh, source of revenue, which is coming from the uh, advertiser side. So as usual, okay, we can get the optimal uh, price by uh, deriving the first of the condition. And the one thing to notice is that as the tower beta increases, the optimal price will go down. Okay, so this is, can be easily uh, derived. So the intuition is that as advertising revenue become more important, so it is more beneficial uh, to expand the consumer side of the market. So in fact, if a tower beta becomes too large, then it may be optimal to charge a negative uh, price. Okay, so in other words, if we denote the P tilde as the argument max maximizing the profit function, this number can be potentially a negative number. So in that case, uh, we impose what you call the non-negative uh, price constraint. So what that means is, okay, so the, the, the reason uh, we impose non-negative non -negative price constraints is that there may be various uh, moral hazard and, and, and uh, adverse selection uh, uh, reasons, okay, why uh, negative price may not be uh, feasible. So in that case, we are going to uh, impose the non-negative price constraint. That means that optimal price will be maximum of P tilde and the zero. In other words, if P tilde turns out to be negative, then the preference price will be constrained to be, uh, to be zero. So then uh, when we substitute back the optimal price in the profit function, then we have the maximized profit as a function of uh, U and uh, beta. So to study uh, the monopolist uh, incentives in technology adoption, uh, which can affect both uh, U and beta, we analyze how change in U and the beta affect the firm's profit. In other words, we totally uh, differentiate the profit function with respect to U and uh, beta. So then uh, as a standard in the consumer theory, uh, we can derive the firm's indifference curve called the ISO uh, profit curve, uh, which is nothing but the locus of a U and beta that would have provided the same monopoly uh, uh, profit. And then the slope of the isoprobic curve represents uh, the platform's uh, marginal uh, willingness to substitute U for uh, beta. And it can be derived as the ratio of what you call the private marginal value of U and the private marginal value of uh, beta. So private marginal value of U is uh, how much additional profit the monopolist can get when you increase it by one unit. And similarly for, for uh, beta. So we perform a similar analysis for uh, social uh, welfare. So we first define social welfare as the sum of the monopoly profit and the consumer surplus and the advertised surplus. Uh, then uh, we can uh, derive ISO welfare curve, okay, as we did for the ISO profit curve. So, which is the locus of U and beta that would yield the same uh, welfare Sorry. level. Uh, JP, yeah. Jacques, uh, can I ask a question, please? Yeah, sure. The P star, which are in the uh, social, the, the P star in the social welfare uh, ISO, profit curve, ISO welfare curve will not be the same as the P star in the... Uh, Okay, so, so here actually we are looking at the uh, second best uh, outcome. In other words, the P star and P is chosen by the, by the uh, platform. Okay, we are not going to consider the case where the social planner chooses the P. Okay, so you're assuming that the social welfare can only control U and beta. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, that, that is correct, yes. So I should have mentioned that. Okay, thank you for pointing that out. Okay, so, yeah, so, so the slope of ISO welfare curve uh, can be also similarly derived as the ratio of the social marginal uh, value and the social marginal value of, social marginal value of U and also social, social marginal value of beta. So which will be different from the private marginal values 
uh, due to the existence of what they call external effect on C consumer surplus and advertiser surplus. So in other words, when you and beta changes, uh, they can affect the consumer surplus and the advertiser surplus, but uh, those effects can will be will be ignored by the by the platform. So which leads to uh, biases in the platform's uh, technology adoption. So to analyze uh, private and the social uh, incentives for technology adoption and uh, identify potential biases in the market outcome. So we compare the slopes of the ISO profit and the ISO welfare curves uh, measured at the current level of UN beta. So to elaborate uh, on uh, this point, if the platform values an increase in you, because this is a relative, relative to beta, more than a social planet does, uh, then we say that the platform's technology adoption is a consumer, surplus, consumer side uh, uh, biased. And similarly, if the platform values an increase in beta, this is a relative, relative to beta more than a social planet does, then we say that uh, the platform uh, favors advertising side. So we call that uh, technology adoption is uh, AS uh, biased. And that this idea can be uh, captured by the definition given uh, below here. So more specifically, if the slope of the ISO profit curve is uh, steeper than the ISO welfare curve, uh, this means that platform is willing to sacrifice more beta uh, to have a one unit of increase in you. Okay, in that sense, we say that a platform's uh, technology adoption is a CS uh, bias. Okay, so let me explain this concept by using a graph. So this graph illustrates a situation of a CS uh, bias. So if you look at uh, this quadrant, okay, so this area represents technologies uh, that provide a higher U and the less beta okay, compared to the current level of UN beta. So the origin represents, let's say, U null and the beta null. Okay, so this is the current level of UN beta. So then uh, if one unit, to increase one unit of U, so here actually, uh, so I should say that uh, here the uh, blue curve is ISO welfare curve and the red curve is the ISO profit curve. So to have a one more unit of U, social plan is willing to sacrifice beta only this much, but platform is willing to sacrifice uh, more. Okay, so that is the source of discrepancy. And the shaded area in this in here, okay, will represent the areas where social plan incentives and uh, the platform incentives uh, diverge. So this area is the case where uh, the technology adoption is uh, profitable for the, for the platform, but it would be uh, welfare uh, reducing. Okay. And the other side is the area where uh, technologies are uh, giving more beta and the less you. And in that case, we are going to have uh, the opposite case. So those technology will be actually uh, will be socially beneficial, but will not be uh, adopted by, by, uh, by the prep, okay? So similarly, AS bias technology adoption can be explained in the similar way, in a similar way. So this would be the case where ISO profit curve is actually flatter than, than, uh, the, than the ISO welfare curve. Okay, so to uh, gain some intuition, so let me start with a very simple case of uh, inelastic demand. So there is no uh, a change in demand. So we are going to assume that a consumer size is fixed at a D. And uh, let's assume homogeneous consumers having the same reservation value of uh, a U. Okay. So then uh, when U increases by let's say one Euro, then the monopolists can charge one Euro more for each consumer because here the demand is assumed to be, to be uh, inelastic and uh, fixed. So the benefit for the platform will be simply a D. And if beta increases by one euro, then the monopolist will receive additional revenue of uh, tau, tau beta, okay? So 
the private marginal, uh, private marginal value of beta of one unit increase will be given by tau d. Okay, so if you look at the slope of the isoprofit curve, that is given by one over tau. So this is uh, bigger than uh, one. So this is bigger than one, okay? So that means that one unit of increase in U is more valuable than one unit increase in, in beta. Okay, they will be equal only when tau is equal to one and the, uh, the platform can, can extract the, the whole surplus from the advertised side. Now, if you look at the uh, social marginal value of an increase in U and D, they are simply a D and D, okay? So here, when you look at the social marginal value of a beta, so social, the social plan will also look at the surplus given to, 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 to the advertisers. So it will be just a D. Okay, so then a social planner will value a increase in U and the beta exactly in the same way. So the slope will be one. So if you just compare these two, so it is immediate that a monopoly platform the technology adoption is a CS bias. So another way to look at it is we can also compare private marginal value of U and the social marginal value of uh, U. So then there's no difference. Okay? They are equal to each other because uh, the, the platform will extract all consumer surplus. But if you compare these two, so they, there is a difference about one minus a tau D. Okay, so that's another way to see the, the bias. Okay, so now uh, let me move. So in fact, the reason uh, I started with the inelastic demand is that the result here carries over to the case of uh, elastic demand. So, so the, the result will be the same, even though we allow elastic demand. And uh, I will try to explain uh, uh, why that is true okay, by uh, just uh, uh, by using some intuition. Okay. So recall that for inelastic demand, as I showed in the previous slide, so there's no difference between social marginal value and the private marginal value in terms of U, but there will be some difference in uh, beta. And now we do the same exercise for the uh, elastic uh, demand case. So then when we look at the difference between uh, social marginal value and uh, private uh, marginal value, so then this is zero is the same as here. And then they, we have a one additional term here. And also, if you look at the beta component, so the first term is the same as the one we see from the inelastic demand case. And then there is also additional term. Okay. So the main reason why the result for inelastic demand curve, uh, curve carries over to the elastic demand is that actually these two additional terms turn out to cancel out in a sense. Okay. So to interpret, so let me look at this component. So what this means is that when the value of uh, the value u increases by one unit, so this is special shows okay how much of that benefit will be passed on to uh, consumers. Usually, when u increases by one unit, the platform will not increase the price by one unit. So some of them will be some of the benefit will be passed on to consumers. That is captured by uh, this term. And as a result, the demand will increase and uh, there will be some uh, uh, demand de price mediated uh, uh, effect. Okay, so that is the additional term we have here. And this term can be also interpreted in a similar way. So when beta increases, it will also affect uh, uh, price. Okay, so if you remember when tau beta increases, advertising revenue becomes more important, so price will go down. So when beta increases, the platform will have an incentive to reduce uh, consumer side price. That will be also beneficial. And if you look at the term, this term and this term is the same. So, and then we compare the how much is passed on to consumers through U and the beta. It turns out that there is a very special relationship between uh, these two. Okay, so that is coming in the next slide. So in particular, if tau is equal to one, so then the pass-through rate turns out to be exactly uh, the same. Okay. If tau is less than one, so then it will be given by, uh, by uh, this relationship. Okay. So then this special relationship uh, turns out to, to make 
these two terms just cancel out, and we are going to have a very similar result as the inelastic uh, demand. Okay, so that's the kind of like a, a intuition uh, we have. So, okay, so basically, okay, so we are going to have a lemma, so which is we are going to compare the slopes of the uh, isotropic curve and the welfare curve. And this term is the one we actually derived earlier for the inelastic demand. And we have some additional term okay, to reflect uh, demand uh, responses, but this term is always a positive, so it will not change the sign of, uh, sign of this, this, this term. Okay, so as a conclusion, so if, N, if the non-negative price constraint is not binding, so in other words, uh, price, the service is provided for uh, at a positive price, okay, so then we are always going to have uh, CS bias, the technology adoption by the platform. So the only exception is when tau is equal to, uh, to one, okay, so in that case, there will be no uh, distortion. JPL, can I interrupt for one second? So Jacques has an interesting question. Jacques, sure. maybe you want to ask it directly. Sure. Jacques, you Sorry. are muted. Yeah, yeah, I'm unmuted now. Uh, yes, uh, here you are basically assuming that you can compute social welfare by adding the welfare of the consumers and the welfare of the advertisers. Uh, but the welfare of the advertisers uh, is not really directly social welfare. It depends, you know, where it's coming from, whether it distorts the consumption choices and yeah. so on. So uh, I'm a little bit worried about you. How do you use the results for guide to policy making? Okay, so, so, okay, so that, that is, I mean, excellent point. Okay, so, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, okay, we actually adopt a very uh, reduced form uh, modeling strategy. And when we do the social welfare calculation, so our assumption is that uh, advertising side, uh, surplus, okay, so that is not a pure waste. Okay, so essentially we have in mind where uh, advertising is maybe, I mean, if you uh, just look at the, the classic case of whether, whether uh, advertising is informative or wasteful, so essentially we are, we are looking at the case where uh, advertising is uh, more informative case. Okay, so we provided some, some uh, micro foundation in the paper, but yeah, I mean, but obviously there will be some cases where advertising may be uh, purely socially uh, wasteful. Okay, but, but couldn't yeah, you, at the minimum, you could add a parameter, which would be the percentage of uh, advertisers' profits, uh, which is uh, wasted. I okay, mean, yeah, uh, that could be, yeah. So we, yeah, so yeah, so we, we I think that we could, uh, we could, uh, uh, yeah, we could uh, uh, introduce another parameter, how much is waste, wasted. Uh, so then I think we can, we can in, in our framework, we can do the analysis, yeah, yeah. I think so, yes. So can I go on? It's fine yes, with me. Please. Thank you very much. Yes, please. Okay. Go okay. Ahead. So now, so, so so we look at the case where uh, the MPC is not binding. Okay. In other words, the services are provided for free, and the prices can can adjust. Okay. So then we look at the case where the MPC is binding, so price is constrained to be zero. So if you look at the uh, first of the condition. So this is uh, the condition, but if this condition is uh, not satisfied for any uh, positive price, and that this term is even negative at when it is evaluated at price equal to zero, then uh, the uh, NPC constraint is binding. In other words, under this condition, the optimal price we derive will be a negative number. And then if we impose the uh, non-negative price constraint, then now price will be equal to zero. So in that case, the monopoly profit revenue source is only coming from the uh, advertiser side. So now we have a profit function given uh, in this way. So in other words, the P uh, term is P term disappears. So then we can derive ISO profit curve and ISO welfare curve, and we do the uh, usual analysis. Then uh, we, what we derive is that uh, always, uh, the ISO welfare curve will be steeper than ISO profit curve. So what that means is that uh, the monopolist, monopolistic platforms uh, technology adoption uh, will exhibit the uh, advertiser side uh, bias. Okay, I mean, so you know, intuitively, right? So if you are not going to receive any, any uh, uh, revenue, okay, any revenue from the consumer side, 
So then the incentive to provide the more valuable service will be, will be limited for the platform. Okay, that's one way to, to think about. Okay, so the summary is the following. So when we consider a monopoly, monopoly two-sided platform, okay, so we consider two cases, whether the MPC bind or does not bind. And as you can see, we have a completely uh, different results. Okay, so if the MPC is not binding, then it will be consumer side biased. But if MPC binds on the consumer side and services are provided for free, then it will be uh, adverse, advertised uh, biased. So this is, I mean, so this implies that it is important when we formulate a, a public policy. So it is important, okay, to distinguish the two, two uh, cases. So before we go to the uh, duopoly model, okay, so let me uh, do some, uh, let me discuss some, some policy uh, implications. So as I mentioned in the introduction, so our analysis can be uh, reinterpreted as a platform the incentive to adopt uh, certain policies that may have a differential effect on the consumer and the advertiser. side. So we can think of two such policies. So the first is platform's uh, privacy policy. So collection of uh, consumers' sensitive information uh, may allow the platform to engage in more precise targeted advertising and hence uh, increase ad revenue, but impose a private cost, uh, cost on, on the consumers. Okay? So the platform's decision on how much information to collect can be thought of, uh, can be thought of how much you to give up uh, to increase the beta in our uh, frame. So, and whether the trade-off calculation by the platform is uh, biased compared to the socially optimal one. Okay? So they can be uh, analyzed in, in, in the same uh, frame. So the infamous uh, Cambridge uh, Analytica scandal is uh, due to Facebook's uh, lax uh, privacy policy. And uh, our research uh, suggests that the lax uh, privacy policy can be a consequence of the Facebook's uh, market power and its uh, free uh, service. And the platform's uh, ad load uh, decision, so that is how much advertising to show to consumers can also be analyzed in a, a similar way. So in the case of a Google uh, search, uh, showing a great, greater share of ads, ads relative, to, relative to organic search results can induce users click on ads more, okay? but some Ad content will be uh, less uh, relevant to the user search query, so it may uh, compromise uh, the query uh, the, the, the quality experienced by, 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 by the user. Okay, so this is uh, the same as uh, uh, beta increases, but at the expense of uh, you. So the same trade trade offs uh, exist for display advertising done by platforms like like uh, Facebook. So a higher ad load can lead to higher advertising revenue, but inflict more nuisance costs on, on, on consumers. Okay. So there are some evidence for that I mean, in, the, in the CMA report. Okay, so now uh, I have uh, how many more minutes? Maybe 10 minutes? Okay, so let me briefly mention, uh, uh, let me briefly uh, go over the Diopoli model. So we are going to consider duopoly model with horizontal uh, differentiation. So we are going to consider a symmetric duopoly and a representative platform eyes demand on the consumer side can be written in this way. So how much uh, net surplus is provided by platform I and how much net surplus is provided by uh, a rival uh, platform. Okay. And we are going to do uh, exactly the same uh, method so we are going to define the platform, the profit function, and the derive ISO welfare curve, I mean ISO profit curve, and compare to the ISO uh, welfare curve. So here one, uh, so when we have a duopoly model, so there is a one additional uh, uh, thing to consider. So that is what we call a strategic uh, effect. So when we look at how the platform's uh, profit changes, okay, when U and the beta change, Okay, so there'll be some, some strategic effects. Okay, so when platform one's uh, U1 increases, okay, so that will affect uh, 
the other platforms of price. Also, when beta one changes, it will also affect the other firms uh, price on the consumer side. But it turns out, okay, even in the duopoly case, our results, if, as long as the non-negative price constraint is not binding, you know, as long as the price is positive, uh, surprisingly, we get exactly uh, the same uh, result. And also, the reason behind that uh, uh, robustness is also coming from, uh, so let me call the uh, duopoly pass-through rates, okay, result. We, this is a very similar result uh, we had uh, earlier. So in particular, when tau is equal to one, so this is the condition, okay, we derived for the, for the uh, monopoly case. And now when we look at, okay, when we look at uh, the effect of a U1 increase and the beta one increase on P2, so that we call a pass-through rate via stretching effect, that also turned out to be the same, okay, across uh, U and uh, beta. So this, this uh, pass-through pass rate equalization uh, results, okay, actually uh, yield uh, the same uh, results. So I'm not going to go, I mean, due to the lack of time, I'm not going to go into the detail. So the punchline, okay, punchline is, once again, when we compare ISO profit and ISO welfare curve, so that can be expre expressed in the following way. So this expression is the same as the inelastic demand when we look at the, when you look at the, uh, so in the, the simple case of in less demand, and uh, there'll be additional term here, okay? But this term is once again, uh, uh, non-negative. So the sign will not uh, change. Okay, so let me summarize. So when we consider a competitive bottleneck model, as long as the MPC does not bind and the price is a positive, then, uh, technology adoption incentive will be once again uh, CS uh, biased. So then what if the non-negative price constraint is a binding? So then uh, we can derive that, uh, we can derive the following result. Okay, so when we compare the ISO welfare curve uh, slope and the ISO profit curve uh, slope, so if you remember, so this is the term we had for the case of the monopoly. Now with competition, we have uh, one more term, okay, so what we call a business uh, stealing effect. So in the monopoly case, because the second term does not exist, so ISO welfare curve is already steeper than ISO profit curve, which, is, which says that uh, the, the platform choice is uh, advertising side uh, biased. But now the result can be reversed, okay? If this business stealing effect is sufficiently large and this is bigger than one. Okay. So that leads to the following uh, proposition. So when we consider a duopoly model, if NPC binds on the consumer side, then it can be AS biased as in the monopoly model if competition is not strong. Okay, so if in the, in the, in the three cases, I mean, if there's no competition, it will be boiled down to essentially the same as the monopoly model. So then we are going to replicate the, the same result. But if the business stealing effect is a sufficiently large, or well, another way of saying is that competition is a very intense. Okay, so then uh, we cannot rule out the case where uh, in the MPC binding case, the platform, uh, Price can be can be can be towards uh, CS. Okay, and actually we verified this one in the hoteling model. So actually we uh, look at the hoteling model and the logic demand model. Okay, to illustrate our results. So when we look at the uh, hoteling model, so hoteling model is uh, we can consider uh, competition is very strong because the market size is fixed. So the only way you can increase your demand is at the expense of the other firm. So in that sense, competition is intense. And we show that in the hoteling model, indeed, uh, bias is actually CS bias rather than AS bias as in, in the monopoly case. Okay. So I'm not going to go over uh, hoteling model and the larger model in detail. So in summary, uh, this table uh, just summarizes the, the, the everything I, I, I presented uh, today. Okay, so. Regardless of the market structure, 
if the NPC is not binding, then we are going to have a consumer side uh, uh, biased uh, technology adoption. But when NPC is binding, in the monopoly case, we are already going to have a AS biased. So this one shows that actually whether NPC binding or not binding, okay, can make a huge difference. But we, if you compare the market structure, in the duopoly case, we will also have a AS biased technology adoption if competition is weak. But if competition is very strong, then the monopoly result can, can be, can be uh, reversed. Okay, so I mean, so, so that, that's about it. Okay, so then uh, maybe uh, some potential extension we can consider maybe. So our analysis in, in a sense is a local analysis, but if there's a big change in mu and beta, so then the regime itself may change. Okay, so we separately analyze the non-negative price constraints are binding or not, okay, but with big change in UN beta, then there can be some, some regime change. And also when we look at the technology adoption in the duopoly case, we only look at the unilateral uh, incentives to, to adopt, but uh, if the rival firm can also adopt uh, similar technology, okay, so then that's some, some additional, additional cons consideration we have, to, we have to, to look at. And also in the duopoly case, we look at only the symmetric uh, uh, case but maybe asymmetric initial condition can be also so, uh, explored. Okay, so as a concluding remarks, okay, we emphasize the role of a non-negative price constraint, meaning that whether service is provided for free or not, okay, that will make a huge difference. And our result may provide a, ration, a rationale for a tough competition policy uh, to curb concentration in platform markets, okay, as long as Competition authorities are concerned about uh, consumer uh, surplus. Okay. Okay, so that's uh, uh, about it. Thank you, JPL. Um, Martin, shall we move into the discussion? If there's nothing better we can do, I can start. That um, is the best thing we can do. Yeah, okay. Let's see. Um, so that's so. First, thank you very much for allowing me to read uh, this paper. I guess it's uh, it has great bones, and uh, you may still work a little bit on the flesh. Uh, so JP was, uh, I think, explaining very clearly the the bones, and uh, then in terms of the interpretations, there I, I'm not completely convinced yet, and it may just require spelling out things more carefully for me. Uh, for example, the privacy policy part, um, my understanding would be that consumers typically would be affected differentially. Uh, so it's not just a you, uh, there's something else going on. And then I don't see how the analysis uh, directly can be used uh, to address such a privacy issue. Uh, regarding the ad load, I thought, well, this is actually a model we have seen a lot in this in the literature, but the way it's a different take because what you're doing is really doing a second best, which means that you're looking at a regulator, which, for example, can fix the, uh, the ad volume, uh, but then cannot control the price charged to the consumers in the two-sided pricing setting. And I haven't, perhaps it has been done some there, but I haven't seen it. So in that sense, even though this literature is, is pretty big, uh, it still kind of takes a, a new angle, at least as far as I understand. And, uh, and I think the paper may benefit from working a bit more on, on these kind of applications, because at the beginning you say, well, they, you don't know any formal investigation on the relationship between platform market power and innovation incentives. And then you exactly explain that um, actually uh, there are other ways of interpreting it, things and those things we have seen before. And so when you say that there are limited resources to provide U and B, so that's, I guess, a resource interpretation, which then links you uh, to B. So you fix one and then uh, the other one follows. Uh, a different way to think about it, and there are a number of papers on this, is to think about seller competition on the platform. Yeah, so in some sense, you're, uh, the platform chooses the number of sellers, which then affects your beta. 
and it affects the you. And so I think that's another way of thinking about uh, your model uh, allowing for this um, choice of the number of sellers as a separate uh, decision by the platform. And uh, the, so there are a number of papers doing this. And I think the one which is closest, but um, I mean, he's in the audience, so he might uh, tell us more, is uh, Tata Ote with a paper from last, uh, he wrote yeah, last year, uh, where exactly looks at uh, the kind of um, platform design regarding the number of sellers allowed on the platform. And I think uh, this, this fits uh, within your setting. Uh, so overall, I think it's, uh, it's really great. One thing I was a bit surprised, uh, is I understand it's nice to think about whether the zero price constraint is binding or not. Uh, but there may be other reasons uh, why there are zero prices on the buyer side. So it's not because of a uh, binding zero price constraint, but say because of uh, technology. If you look back, uh, commercial television, uh, so it was just not feasible in the early days to charge uh, viewers. And then uh, later on with the uh, cable uh, programs, uh, it, it became possible. So it's sometimes it's just also... Uh, the question uh, whether pricing is technological feasible or even if it is feasible, there are opportunity costs of uh, making consumers pay. And uh, so there are a number of reasons of why in some environments we have a zero price and others we don't. Also, you may even think of that in some environments it is actually possible uh, to avoid kind of free riding behavior and have negative prices. So therefore I would start more broadly and then uh, only talk about whether or not this zero price constraint is binding as, as, as one way of uh, structuring your result. But I think there are many other uh, market environments where it's not about whether the optimal price is negative or positive on the consumer side, but whether, say, the technology allows you to charge it or whether the opportunity costs of making consumers pay are high or not. Um, and I think... I used my time, or well, at least I used a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Uh, so we can now open it up to a general Q&A. Yeah, so uh, to respond to, to uh, first of all, thank you to, to Martin, okay, so for, for great uh, comment. So yes, I mean, in our paper, actually it does not matter where the source of the non-negative price constraint is coming. It could be technological, I mean, region. I mean, so whatever the region, okay, we are going to, we can just straight forward, we can, we can apply the, our analysis. And the, the, the reason we actually indulgently drive is that if we just assume the price is equal to zero, then people will ask why, why I mean, platform charge uh, zero price, okay? So we just try to, to justify by indulgency driving. But in our paper, if, the platform can charge a negative price. So the reason, the usual reason that uh, the platform cannot charge a negative price is uh, various moral hazard and legislation problem, and there is some, some monitoring problem. If that issue can be uh, uh, addressed and the platform can actually charge a negative price, then we can just apply uh, the, uh, the case where uh, the first case, okay, which is a non-negative price is not binding. Okay, we can, I mean, it doesn't matter whether the price is a negative or not. We can just uh, straightforward, we can apply the, the large. And also one difference, so actually we have also non-negative price concern in, in, in my paper, once again with Toshin on, on the leverage theory of time. So in this paper, actually non-negative price constraint is actually essential, okay, essential in the sense that that is necessary to derive the leverage mechanism. But in our paper, the non-negative price constraint is not essential, okay? If it's not binding, then we just apply the, the, the first model. And then if it happened to be binding, then we just apply the second model, okay? So in our paper, we just consider the two cases, but the non-negative price constraint is not uh, essential for our story. I, I have a question. Uh, do you assume exogenously whether price is positive or negative, or can you endogenize the condition on which the price is uh, positive or negative, and when it's negative, you assume it's equal to zero. No, I mean, as I just explained, we, we endogenously derive the condition uh, under which uh, the 
constraint is binding. So that is a slide. Uh, okay, so where is this? So that is. Uh, Okay, so this is this is the uh, okay, so so this is the condition. Okay, when the non-negative plus constraint boundary, as you can see, tau beta is a very big. In other words, advertiser side is a very important. So then the price will be a doping price will be will be negative. So I had a question about the menus of contracts on the consumer side. Mm -hmm. This is Özlem speaking. So I mm -hmm. uh, was wondering how the the results would change if you allowed the menus like premium models, you know, free option. So the price zero, if you allow me to see, if I allow you to show me more ads versus price version without or fewer ads. Okay, so I mean, so that's a good question because in the real world, okay, we actually see that kind of a menu, like a Spotify, okay, right. there's a premium account and then you just uh, pay and you do not get any advertising and the free service and you uh, you get free service, but in return for, for advertising, okay. So exactly. that's an, an excellent question, but to address that question, I think we need a more, uh, I mean, a more elaborate uh, model on the consumer side. Okay, so we have to introduce some kind of uh, vertical vertical dimension. Okay, so that mm -hmm. I mean, so high types we will get premium service and the low types we get free service. Okay, I think we need a more 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 elaborate uh, consumer side model. Because so Etienne, this past sorry. Uh, so here Andrea. actually, I mean, so if if it, actually when this is one one constraint is that we are assuming that demand is depending only u minus p. So when you yeah. increase it, right? So all consumers value will increase by one unit. So maybe we need to have some kind of like a theta u kind of like we need some heterogeneity in terms of how a quality will be will be will be uh, yeah valued by 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 uh, different consumers. Okay, so we need uh, another parameter to address that issue. Actually, uh, we have a, a companion paper on on actually we are looking at now R and D incentives in in two sides of the markets. So here we look at just a very simple technology adoption choice, but in that companion paper, I mean, which is in progress, I mean, it has been sitting for many years, but we have not able to complete it, complete the paper. But in that actually paper, we look at uh, the platform the incentives, how much to invest on the on the consumer side and on the advertiser side. So in that case, actually, we uh, introduce uh, this kind of uh, uh, parameter, and we we do a analysis along along the lines you you mentioned. Okay, but here in the current paper, you also have this parameter or the measure, which is how much platform pass through the changes mm -hmm. in the U. So mm -hmm. it's a very, it's a reduced form thing, but this mm -hmm. should depend on specification of the demand. So yeah. you have results depending on this pass through, basically. So yeah, yeah. So I, I agree. I agree with that. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so obviously, some research. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it depend on, on the specific uh, details of our model, yes. Okay, thank you. Hey, Bill, it's Andre. Um, one thing I was wondering, I think the, so the, the, uh, the issue of like looking at the conflict between advertisers and users, I think it's a super interesting problem. I think it's actually more general than that. So you can ask more generally, it doesn't have to be two-sided platforms between advertisers and users. It could be generally, uh, you have two sides and, there, and let's assume you have like design issues or sorry, the decision problems that can affect the welfare on two sides. It strikes me that you can sort of generalize the model. Mm -hmm. And of course, the more complex, what becomes more complicated, then you have two sided pricing. But as a first cut approach, maybe one thing you could do is to basically take the, um, let's say the pricing structure is exogenously given and then basically look at the, um, you know, do the exercise and figure out like the, uh, you know, the, what you had the ISO profit curve, just looking at the, at the, the utility parameters for the two sides. And then you, maybe you can endogenize pricing. I mean, I, it becomes more complicated, obviously, like in the advertising model, well, you only have one, one price here that's endogenous, but I think it's a, it's a very interesting exercise to do more broadly. So, so when you say it can be applied more generally, I mean, do you have some, some uh, specific example in mind? Sure. I mean, you can ask this for any, for, I mean, I can, uh, we can run through like all kinds of two-sided platforms. There's always going to be choices that are going to pit uh -huh. the interest of one side with the other. So I'm going to take Uber, 
Like I can okay. take, I can take Uber, like there's drivers and riders. Well, there's certain things that Uber does that are going to please drivers, but that okay. riders okay. are going to hate, right? Okay. Okay. So it's, it, it would lead to the same kind of, I mean, you can draw the graphs, you can do the ISO profits. I think it's, I think it is very valuable to have okay. that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Well, can I just add, so uh, just as a announcement, uh, the paper also has an, a nice logit analysis in there for the competition case. I think, Jay, you didn't really uh, have time to, to talk about that. So I thought that was pretty nice. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. If, if, if I knew that you have uh, some time left, then I could have covered that. that, that yeah, but, yeah, I didn't know that how much time yeah, we are going to spend on, on discussion. Yeah. But you can, I mean, anyone can read our paper, yeah, <laughs> it's available. Actually, uh, so if we can go back up a little bit, what you, would you say are the main uh, lessons? Uh, I mean, so you gave two examples, uh, but uh, what are the main lessons for competition policy you would draw from your uh, analysis? I mean, uh, you know, what type of cases should you know, does it provide lessons about what type of cases to pick up by firm, by uh, competition authorities? Does it, uh, uh, you know, provide the lessons about type of remedies and so on? I mean, one, so, so one example might be, so let's say, uh, so let's go back to the, okay, so, so look at this uh, table. So then uh, we may say that, uh, so we can consider a dynamic uh, situation, right? So then there are uh, competing uh, platforms. So imagine a situation, uh, so it also depends on whether uh, the competition authorities only care about consumer welfare or uh, they also concerned with, with advertiser side of welfare, right? So for instance, if we look at the case where initially there is a strong competition among platforms, okay? So then uh, we may have some uh, condition like this one. So consumer side will get uh, more benefit, but as one firm becomes uh, dominant as it happens in the, in the big tech uh, merger case nowadays, okay? So some, some like Facebook, Google, they uh, become a dominant firm and uh, become like a monopoly. Then now, as you can see, the bias will change to, to AS bias, right? So I'm mean, just may give, I'm mean, just kind of like a very, I mean, a cheesy kind of a comment, but yeah. So then may, if, if you are really uh, care about actually consumer side of area, then maybe you, there's some, some, some justification to, to try to maintain competition in the platform market. I mean, that's kind of one, 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 uh, uh, one implication we may have. And maybe yes. a portion can add, yeah. Sorry, just to follow up on this. Uh, so what would happen if you have a symmetric situation? Say uh, there is a kind of a monopolistic situation vis-a-vis -vis consumers, but they, there is competition vis-a-vis -vis advertisers, like search markets, for instance. Okay, so uh, that, uh, yeah, we have not yet analyzed. I mean, so that's uh, it, it basically the, the, uh, uh, the last uh, comment I had, right? So we look at a symmetric uh, diopoly case, but obviously uh, one firm is more timely than the other, okay? So what will happen? Yeah, that's uh, something we have not yet, yet analyzed. That will be interesting, I think. Yeah, yeah, not I agree, I fully yeah. agree. Thank you. And I think you did some comparative statics in the competition case and the degree of differentiation between platforms. Uh -huh. And I think the perhaps the one also in line with your introduction uh, the interesting part would be the comparative statics in the in the tau. Uh, okay. Yeah, because in a in a way you can see that so big tech is becoming more powerful and is extracting more of the uh, of the surplus, and uh, so I think that would be uh, would be useful to see and, and whether then the the bias in some sense becomes worse uh, for the for the consumers. 